founded the studio 12 years ago, as you said, uh, two years ago, sorry, 2012, in Berlin. Uh, we're a really young and really experimental studio. And our approach to architecture and urban design is literally through mobility. We don't have traditional clients. We rather have uh, research collaborations with um, an elevator company from uh, Switzerland, Schindler. And since this summer also um, with Audi, the car manufacturer. Actually, as we can see, I mean, the 20th century actually proved that mobility shaped our cities. The elevator city on the left and the car city on the right. If we look at the beginning of the 21st century, now especially in growth markets such as China, I mean, it's actually the, the worst combination of both. We have like singular towers that lead into the kind of social vertical isolation and we have massive infrastructures for cars in between. So I think something fu went fundamentally wrong somehow. And I think we really forget about the people in the cities. And uh, this is uh, on purpose an image a uh, still image that shows people stuck in urban mobility rather than flowing and segregated from each other. I don't know if these people do want to buy a, a car. I think they want to go from A to B as, as convenient, as seamless as possible. And I think we should really mean, uh, overcome the concept of our 20th uh, century technology um, that is really based on the car and elevators, as I showed before. Um, but not only technology, also I think our um, approach to urban planning um, could also, should also be uh, rethought, I believe. Um, right now, we, you know, urban planning is shown mostly in plan, in literally in two-dimensional plan view. Uh, why don't we activate much more uh, the third dimension? Why don't we challenge cities, center and the relation to the periphery three-dimensionally? And... Uh, this is a concept we call uh, Babel Town, and of course, on purpose, it's called Babel Town. This is not a design proposal. Uh, this is a theory and image because we want to provoke um, rethinking also via image. Um, but you know, why don't we think of architecture that produces green space instead of consumes it as we know it? Um, because and uh, you know, the 60s, of course, is really as our years, I, I believe. But I think also. Um, the time to rethink or think like this again uh, is here. I mean, the need to think like that uh, is totally present. Also, the technology is much further now. So, but also other ideas, roller coasters, how could they generate vertical villages stacked on top of each other? How could we use this technology using joints? Therefore, it's not like a roller coaster ride and you throw up uh, after the second turn, but it's like a convenient travel. Um, you know, mobility concepts that are integrated into the horizontal, knit into that, as well as into the vertical, allowing to, you know, subway stops on top of each other, uh, to spread through multiple villages on top of each other. Also, the idea of, um, like, the, the hacking a little bit the, the disciplines between architecture and urban planning. So, is this maybe a scale in between, which is the neighborhood? Um, this is a traditional block on the left in Berlin that is, you know, circ isolated from each other. So, um, with uh, staircases, uh, why don't we think in more uh, kind of horizontal landscapes, um, the idea of a, of a village uh, within a city, um, and this is like prototypes um, we also developed together with Schindler, um, so the idea to also prevent the need for mobility at the other end of the, of the problem, I believe. So this is a little kind of intro, what we're up to, and uh, this is now um, a project I uh, we want to present to you, um, which we just uh, presented on Monday uh, as part of the Audi Urban Future Award. So it's fresh out of press. Uh, and the, it's called Destination Collective. The idea was really to um, the vision of an um, organic um, traffic landscape that is modeled around individual needs. Um, and for this, we actually could work together with people for Audi, the experts for horizontal mobility. Uh, on the left, you see the expert for vertical mobility. And we even work together with uh, people from biomimicry to get inspiration uh, from nature as one of the biggest uh, inspiration for innovation. And uh, for this project, we got in really inspired for how elevators changed or destination control changed the world uh, of elevators. Um, we will actually blur the boundaries between individual and public transportation. Um, we want to hack and activate different layers of infrastructure. And this is a proposal for Berlin. And I think especially in Germany, we should think about a new urban vehicle 75 years after the Volkswagen. Uh, it's probably really time to rethink uh, an urban vehicle. 
Um, and for this, we will then be inspired by nature. And this is uh, not photoshopped, this is uh, reality. And as a result of that, we then can also show how uh, the city of the future of Berlin could look like. Um, and all of this, I want to present you now as a more like a journey uh, uh, through time and space. We will start with today. Um, we will reach um, a new urban development that is uh, on the former site of the uh, Tegel Airport. And we will, uh, 2017, and we will go through a test track. And on the way back, uh, we will show you our vision for the whole entire city of Berlin in 2035. So, you know, we can really uh, lean back, relax, uh, enjoy the ride. It's going to be uh, just 20 years uh, of time it's going to take now. So, and starting in Berlin today, um, it's one of the most exciting cities in Europe, I think. Um, it is relatively small compared to other metropolitan areas, and therefore it doesn't suffer the same scale of problems uh, yet. Um, it is known for its really creative atmosphere, and that's why we also believe it's a really uh, it's a really perfect spot to think about new uh, concept of urban mobility. Um, so that's why we said, let's you know, let's get up, you know, find the hidden potentials, uh, but also really face the problems that we find on the street today. Because I mean, if we, if we step outside of the door, this is not a street anymore. This is mainly a parking lot. Most of the space is consumed for parking. And actually, if we sum up uh, the entire space for Berlin, uh, it adds up to above seven million square meter. And that's actually a space um, you know, comparable for 200,000 people to live in. And Berlin is suffering uh, real estate speculation at the moment. And we, you know, we should ask ourselves, who do we build these cities for? For cars or for people? And um, even though just half of Berlin's household do have a car, now that, yeah, mm -hmm, uh, we end up with like 1.3 million cars in total in, in Berlin. Each of them on, uh, rec um, occupied with only 1.3 persons. Somebody's so that actually means we spend one hour per day uh, isolated by ourselves, totally alone and really frustrating stop and go traffic. Um, and this traffic is actually mainly produced by transit trips crossing through city centers above three kilometers distance. And uh, as these street streets are changing at the moment, I mean, shared cars are rising and that's fantastic, but Remember, they will be stuck in traffic as well. So and if we look at the entire mobility system of Berlin, we, si we find that private car is still the first choice in Berlin, with 38%. And around one third of the people in Berlin are walking and cycling. And the second biggest choice is public transportation, with 27%. That's quite similar to Copenhagen, I think. And um, as I said in the beginning, we want to blur these boundaries and actually you know, propose a collective mobility concept that takes the best of both. And until now, we looked at the problems of private uh, mobility, individual mobility. Let's have a look at public as well, um, public transportation. For example, the subway, um, because it ha runs on static timetables and frequencies, you as an individual user literally always miss a train and you will always wait for the next one. Um, but not only that, but also transfer times between lines, uh, in average right now it's two and a half minutes. That's great, but if we think about that and the entire system, uh, that sums up to six years we lose per day in total. And, you know, these tunnels stay m mainly empty, which is totally crazy if you think about how expensive they are to build. Um, and these tunnels, of course, they are disconnected from each other. Um, and that's why we, as a, when we need to change direction, we need to pass through these architectural bottlenecks uh, that are super expensive and they are not even beautiful, I would say. So what we're trying to overcome is actually the concept of this hub-based transportation uh, and really organize flows by their destination. And uh, this is, you see now here, the, our test site. Um, the airport was just still running at the moment, but once it will be closed, it will be our test site. Uh, and then the, there will be a proposal, our proposal for a flyway which is a, a test track that would lead us there. And what we want to test here is actually the first hybrid solution out of individual and public transportation, and that's based on autonomous driving. The starting point for this, for, the, for this flyway, the test track, is an old elevated train track that was built in the 1920s by Siemens. Um, and we think it's actually, you know, it would be a fantastic chance to 
test autonomous driving within the urban environment and in a real case uh, scenario with real users and um, yeah and it's located in close proximity to this new urban development it's four kilometers long and we want to reconnect it to the uh, existing public transport network so there will be a station that will be our entrance gate to this flyway and in the north we will uh, one proposing to extend an elevated track into the testing site. So as a first hybrid solution, there's a train of electric vehicles taking off and then splitting up on site and serving individual destinations. On the way back, they actually regroup to a train in order to save space uh, on the track. And then we have the moment where they pass by in so-called bypasses that are located uh, along the curves of the track. And because they're there, we can actually design them as super elevations. Um, so in order to save space and to give space to other functions uh, for Berliners, such as you know, cafes, bars, uh, restaurant and sports facilities. So it could become a, you know, a new urban landmark in Berlin. Um, because it's open to the public, it's also a great benefit for the local um, neighborhood. And it's, to sum it up, basically on the left you see it's half, uh, it's 50% um, test track and 50% public uh, park for Berliners. So let's experience by ourselves what it means to fly on the flyway. Uh, with an app we would um, type in our final destination on site and today we're heading to a workshop um, and we find out that actually at the other end of the train there's another colleague from us who's going to the same uh, workshop. And we're both assigned to uh, the car number three. And once we reach Jungfernheide, we, this is the station, this entrance gate uh, to the flyway, we find uh, these vehicles ready for boarding for us. And that's where we actually meet our colleague that we're going to join for the workshop. And once in the car, we see no more steering wheel and the autopilot is actually active, ready to go. And yeah, because it's part of a you know, public transport network, actually everybody could experience uh, autonomous driving technologies. And um, yeah, once we drive on the flyway, we find out that you know, our former uh, stations turn into bars and restaurants for Berliners and for tourists worldwide. And then when, once we reach the new urban development, this, the former airport, then they, this will be turned into a research and science park uh, for the technologies, technologies uh, within the urban environment for the future and they will be invented but also tested here and uh, we actually could test uh, autonomous driving um, in the public space here. So we will be dropped off at our final destination and the car takes off to pick up the next customer. So this is where we should take a little break now. Um, this is everything we've seen so far is really possible with today's technology and um, uh, it's, it, I think it's very important to start learning by doing as well um, because we want to do you know, the step from a local test track to a vision uh, for 2035 that integrates the entire city. And for this, we, you know, all the aspects we've seen so far, we just need, to, uh, just need to extend them to an urban scale for the idea of autonomous driving, uh, the idea of infrastructure hacking, and the concept of destination control. And now we, we've seen vehicles that are looking more or less like vehicles we've seen, we know from the streets today, but we want to um, kind of couple them also physically, spatially, not only virtually like we have seen so far, in order to come up with a true collective mobility concept. Um, and I'm going to start with explaining destination control um, within the elevator world first. And we see here three elevators that are running without destination control. Um, actually where everybody squeezes in, push the button wherever he wants to go, um, and the result is a really frustrating stop and go traffic. And if you're the last one to get out, uh, you're probably quite moody once you're up there. Um, and it's a really competitive behavior. It's something we really experience on the streets as well today. Uh, so now we try again with destination control uh, on the right, where the user puts into his, his final destination before he gets into the cabin, and the system can then uh, group people accordingly. Um, and then it's mathematical algorithms 
that minimize the amount of stops. And at the end of the day, um, everybody is happy because it's a direct way. But not only you make everybody happy through this collaborative behavior, you actually increase the entire system average uh, in sense of um, um, energy efficiency and, and totally waiting time. So this is the concept on the right we want to continue working with and um, transform it from a skyscraper into a, um, an urban layout. That's why we want to you know, take these destinations, floors, and put them laid out next to each other horizontally and think of them as neighborhoods now in a city. Then we want to group people according to their destination neighborhood. Um, they want to travel together along transfer routes above and uh, underground in order not to cross through other uh, neighborhoods. And once we reached our final neighborhood, we split our ways for the last mile, and that can happen on surface again. So that means every neighborhood in Berlin turns into a destination that is connected with all the other neighborhoods in Berlin through a the whole network of existing infrastructures above ground and underground. So now that we understood how and where we, we want, we wish to travel, um, we need a vehicle that can actually do this job for us. And uh, yeah, for this we got inspired by nature, as I said, and if we zoom in a lot now, we are uh, inside a body cell at the moment, inside a skin cell. In this case, we also find roads, different infrastructures. Uh, we find motor proteins and vesicles to carry around proteins through the cell. And I have to say, yeah, it looks super funny, huh? but uh, what's really interesting is the coupling and decoupling of functions. Um, and this allows really a smooth trans transition from one uh, infrastructure to the other. Uh, so what could that mean for a vehicle? And in the case of the car, all these functions are packed underneath one body. And as, we, as I told you, we were working together with the designers as well, and they told us it's a really painful moment to cut out the door at the very end once you have this beautiful design. So we uh, want to decouple these functions inspired by the cell, reorganize the prime mover in the periphery, reduce the cabin size to one-seater, um, and maximize the door size, and then recouple them together very loosely in order to uh, allow a three-dimensional movement because the cabin always uh, stays horizontal. And you can imagine this was a moment where some people in Audi got a bit nervous. Um, but this concept is what we call the fly uh, wheel. And uh, it's actually the smallest unit of collective mobility. Um, and it's, uh, the main, since the main f function now is a door, it can actually couple and decouple with other um, uh, fly wheels. And uh, so it allows growth into both directions because it has doors into both sides. Um, the interior is decoupled and can float freely, quite spacious, and because it can turn, it can become a transporter if needed to transport goods. Um, and because it can turn, it's actually allowing to move three-dimensionally through the city, really steep up and down, and you always stay horizontally. So let's look at the different potentials uh, of different group sizes um, of the flywheels. Uh, it could come, of course, as a one-seater, so it turns into a personal assistant. As a two-seater, it could become a dating app. And as a three-seater or a group-seater, it could turn into a guitar concert, maybe. But I mean, everybody else probably has much better ideas, and that's how we we believe, we, we think of this collective mobility concept as an open innovation platform for the sharing economy. So it's not us to define what it is, but it's an open platform for ideas. And the designers got very excited already, sketched out different ideas. And this is the, one, the model we picked now for a ride home. Uh, now we're in the year 2035. Um, and as we see, navigation became super easy um, through a mobility landscape. Um, the, this home button that we all know from the phone is finally available. And um, the flywheel is just one click away. And actually, there's no congestion. The system becomes better with every additional user. Um, and it's a really yeah, very premium experience because it is very 
um, exactly then, when and where I wanted to be available. Um, it is a very seamless um, experience, um, short connection ramps and tunnels, uh, interconnect different uh, infrastructures into one uh, mobility landscape. Plastic, recycled plastic, turn rail tracks into uh, multifunctional roads. We can activate um, um, power lines that are down there to charge our battery on the go. And as uh, we see, we coupled uh, with someone because we have apparently the same destination. As I mentioned, uh, the chance to meet, our, to meet our neighbor on the way home now is much higher because we, our flows are organized around um, destinations. Uh, we reached our final neighborhood and the flywheel uh, decouples, slows down, turns back into the last mile mode and continue, we're continuing together with our neighbor, our ride to the surface up. And what we find is that this mobility landscape, um, traffic landscape can also be uh, extended above ground. Uh, just as a reminder, this is how the same space looked before. And since we now can organize um, flows three-dimensionally, we can also start to um, stack uh, public space uh, uh, vertically on top of each other. And if needed, we can densify the city wherever uh, if needed. So. Uh, so we're almost home. Uh, let's continue our ride. And because this flywheel is um, shared and autonomous self-driving, and it doesn't have to be parked, and because it's CO2 neutral, because it's silent and small, we can actually now renegotiate the relationship between mobility and architectural and urban space and hopefully come up with uh, different architectural typologies that fit better to the human scale and not to the scale of the car. And uh, so we're back home at the street. We left this morning and we say goodbye to our neighbor. Maybe we just have met because we shared the same way. And now there he is. Bye-bye. And uh, we go to rest, but this um, flywheel doesn't need to sleep, of course, so it could also do other jobs at night. Uh, it could deliver parcels, and uh, you know, just to sum it up, this is um, uh, it's a uh, collective mobility is really it is just in time. It is personalized. It is three-dimensionally and seamless, and it's also uh, scalable. And uh, the flywheel cannot fly yet, but who knows what the future might bring? Thank you very much.